Okay, so this will be our last section, uh, all about the symmetries. Um, and we'll start off that section talking about symmetries and conservations. So if we remember um, from a previous lecture, we had that uh, the Lagrangian of a system, we had the Lagrangian of a system L as one half and um, say Q1 dot squared plus Q2 dot squared minus some V of Q1 minus Q2. The equations of motion of this Lagrangian would, or this system rather, would be P dot 1 is equal to um, Q, will, will be equal to V prime of Q1 minus Q2 and P dot 2 will be equal to minus V prime of Q1 minus Q2. And so when we sum these together, we get P1 dot plus P2 dot is equal to zero. And so we had our idea of uh, conservation. So the total momentum of the system wouldn't change with time. But if we have a look at a little bit more complicated system, where we just really have to change the uh, potential energy, we don't really have to touch the kinetic energy, we say for instance have some function V of AQ1 minus BQ2, Going through the math of this, we find that the equations of motion, so for P1 dot, will be equal to A times V prime, AQ1 minus BQ2, um, and then P2 dot, we have minus B times V prime, AQ1 minus BQ2. And so, summing these, we wouldn't get our conservation model we're looking for, but in a certain, if we sum them in a certain way, i.e. we have a times p1 dot plus b times p2 dot, we'll get a b b prime minus a b b prime, which is zero. So in this way, we do reach our conservation law in the end. And so this kind of gives us the idea of, well, what, uh, what can we do? What, how do we deal with these conservation laws? How do, um, is there a way that we can find out how we conserve or how things are conserved? For instance, if we had, instead of this, we had some uh, V of Q1 minus Q2 squared, we wouldn't be able to find um, that momentum or anything would be conserved in this way. So there's, now we have to try and figure out, is there a way of deciphering or other criteria that allow us to tell how or when something is being conserved and that's really what the focus of we're, what we're doing now with symmetries is. Okay, so now let's um, take an example. If we have, say, we want to make a transformation. Let's say we want to take, um, we, we want to transform Q of i to some Q prime of i, which is itself a function of Q i. So this prime doesn't um, notate a derivative or anything. All we're talking about really is a different version of Q. We could do a capital QI or, or anything like that, but uh, this is the notation we're going to use. Uh, so this means that when it, for whatever coordinate or position QI is at, Q prime of I will be a little bit different. Um, but before we really go into it, we kind of have to understand the idea of different transformation. So we can really break it down into two ways, or two ways of thinking about it. We can either have what's called a passive transformation. And so the idea of this is if we have, say, a number line here with, let's say, 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and we have some uh, some particle at 1, we'll say. And we want to make the transformation, uh, let's call it x to x plus 1. Well, the way of passively, the passive way of thinking about this is we keep this particle where it is and we move the entire coordinate system with it. So in this case, we'd be moving one step back. And so this passive way of doing it, we'd end up with the same number of the particle in the same place, but at this point it will be at 2, or this would be 3, and 4, 
and this would be 1, 0, minus 1, etc. Uh, but the idea is that the parallel itself stays the same and the coordinate system is moved around. However, there is another way of thinking about it, which is the active transformation. So imagine we have the same situation. We have a number line here, 0, minus 1, minus 2, 1, and 2. And we set up our variable here. Now, under the transformation x, so x plus 1, we think about keeping the coordinate position, the, the coordinate system the same, and moving the particle. So now, we'll imagine the same number line at uh, minus 2, 1, or minus 1 rather, 0, 1, and 2, and the particle will have moved to the position 2 under this transformation. Now in reality, this is they're achieving the same thing in the end, but just with different ways of thinking about it. And the way that we're going to be really thinking about it is in the active, uh, in the active sense. Okay, so now let's think about if we have um, some transformation from Q to Q plus some delta, where delta is just some real number that's very, that can be very, very small. Um, when we have our Lagrange, when we have a Lagrange, let's say for instance L equals one half m q dot squared, and we want to see how this Lagrangian will react to this transformation we're putting under. Well, we we know that um, if we take q dot, this transformation will be well. We'll have q dot here from this part. And because the delta is only a real number, it's derivative of the first of time, we'll go to zero, and so we'll just have this. And so the uh, coordinate change in this case doesn't actually um, change the Lagrangian. But if we were to have, say, for instance, our own, an example of a more complicated function, let's say L being one half um, q1 dot squared plus q2 dot squared minus v of q1 minus q2. Well, if we put q1 under this transformation, the kinetic energy here will be the same, but our potential will end up with being minus v q1 plus some delta minus q2, which will break our symmetry. And we'll have just a random constant in our um, potential energy, and so it won't work. But if we were to include our Q2 in the transformation, we get that the potential would be Q1 plus delta minus Q2 minus delta. And so the delta will cancel out, and we'll be left with a, another, another symmetric situation. So now what happens when, instead of doing what we were given an example with here, we're going to be talking about rotations. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at um, another situation. But this is, we're going to head back to Cartesian coordinates for the moment. Um, and we'll have that our Lagrangian L will be equal to 1 half um, x dot squared plus y dot squared minus v of x squared plus y squared. Right, so this is going to ring home to a little bit of like rotations um, and such. So when we have, when we put a transformation in that x goes to x cosine theta plus y sine theta and y will go to some y or minus y cos theta or sorry, minus x sine theta plus y cos theta um, and we'll have a look at this. So we are able to finitely and discreetly transform um, say, or transform our coordinate space and um, the last one. We have, you know, q would go to q plus 1 and so on. But I mean there's nothing stopping, there's nothing that makes that special. We could have q goes to q plus 0 0.1 or 0.001 or so on and so on. 
And so what would happen if we were to um, say let Q go to Q plus delta for some infinitesimally small delta? Well, you, we wouldn't really get too big a, too big a transformation at first, but we will be able to continuously then build it up. Like, uh, almost like an integral, right? We, we deal with um, sums of infinitesimally small parts continuously built up. Uh, rather than a discrete sum, which is what we were we would do with likes of q plus or q goes to q plus one, um, and so forth. So if we were to instead take this as instead of theta, we would have some delta instead, um, with some delta, some very small angle. Now remember, this here describes our rotation by angle theta. That's very important. Remember our. We have like a rotation matrix and so on before. So if we were to replace theta by some infinitesimally small angle of delta, how what would we be able to do with that? Well, there's thing, something called the small angle approximation, which would be useful here. And that basically says that um, cos of delta is equal to one, and sine of delta is equal to delta for some delta that's very, very small. And um, right, so the way that we we can approach this from um, McLaurin theory, we can kind of show that this is true, uh, but that's kind of outside the scope of this uh, series. We won't retouch on that, but it is quite simple. You can, uh, you will see how it works in your in your first year of college. But if we were to think of it, uh, let's just think of it from the graph graphical point of view, right? Let's have sine theta in the blue here, or sorry, in the green here. And at the, it will look something like this. Whereas we have, say, cosine theta in the blue. We'll see this. We'll look something along those lines. And, right, but if we zoom in here, let's say to this block, just here. So this is where and delta, or theta rather, which is this axis here, this axis is theta. If we were to zoom in this block, we'd see we had, say, this axis here, this axis here, and sine of theta, which is in the green, would look like this. It would be a very, very small block, just a line where, and it would basically be y equals theta, which is why it is just a small block and zooming on it, we'd see that if we had the, say, the axis somewhere down here, at least a bit down, we'd have that the angle cosine theta would look like this, where this here, this location on the y-axis is equal to 1. So this is why we can approximate uh, cosine theta, cosine delta in this case, equal to one, and sine equal to, or sine delta equal to delta, for very, very small deltas. Okay, so now that we have that covered, um, and we can approximate these, let's sort of back into our transformation. Right, so for very small delta, so the idea is we're gonna rotate by a very, very small delta and build these up we'll have that x, we'll go to x cos delta, with cos delta equal to 1, so that leaves with x, and plus y sine delta, with sine delta equal to delta, so we'll have plus y times delta, and then x will go to minus x sine delta, with sine delta equal to delta, we'll have that as minus x times delta, plus y cosine delta, with cosine delta equal to 1, we'll have y. Okay, so right, so being able to kind of, well, with y here, being able to rewrite this, we'll say that's y minus x times delta. Just so our x and y are in a somewhat more similar format. Okay, so now that we have this, we can calculate their uh, time derivatives. So this means that x dot, we'll go to x dot 
plus y dot delta. Because remember, delta is just some constant, so I don't have to worry about that. And y dot will go to y dot minus x dot delta. Okay, so now that we have our um, derivatives taken like this, let's square them and subdivide. Okay, so that means we're going to let x dot squared be x dot squared plus 2x dot y dot delta plus y dot delta and y dot squared will be y dot squared plus 2 or minus 2 x dot y dot delta plus or sorry y dot squared delta squared y dot plus sorry x dot squared delta squared with this y dot squared and delta squared being up here in our in our x transformation. Okay, so now we can so this back into our Lagrangian and we'll get this is m over 2 times right we'll have x dot squared plus y dot squared delta squared plus y dot squared plus x dot squared delta squared with remember this here when we sum these this will cancel out with this and we'll have v of x squared plus y squared so in with x squared plus y squared we just take off the derivatives from here and we'll be able to know that this is going to be x dot squared plus or sorry x squared plus y squared delta squared so i'll just draw a line here plus x squared plus y delta y squared delta squared plus y squared plus x squared delta squared okay okay right so now that we have this let's see what happens when delta does in fact go to an infinitesimally small number so we'll let, let's say we'll take the limit as well as delta tends to zero of the Lagrangian which would be the limit as delta tends to zero of m over two times x dot squared plus y dot squared delta squared plus y dot squared plus x dot squared delta squared minus v of x squared plus y squared delta squared plus y squared plus x squared delta squared right um, and so when we're taking our limit here there's no fancy business and um, coming from quotients or anything like that so we can say that this will go to zero because as delta goes to zero this will go to zero as delta goes to zero this part here will go to zero as delta goes to zero and this final term here will go to zero so anything with a delta in it will go to zero and so we'll have that the limit well actually we'll notice this is um, L prime right so this um, transform the Lagrangian instead of keeping it as L we'll keep it as L prime and uh, the limit as delta t or as delta goes to zero of L prime is equal to m over 2 times x dot squared plus y dot squared minus v of x squared plus y squared okay and so we notice now that this f, uh, this Lagrangian here this l prime is in fact the same one that we started with here and so we can therefore say that l prime is equal to l oh sorry rather the um, limit as delta goes to zero of L prime is equal to L. And so we can say that this Lagrangian is symmetric under rotational symmetry. Okay, so before we get into a little bit more exa uh, examples of symmetries, we need to generalize our definition of what a symmetry is. So we're not dealing with just infinitesimally small rotations 
uh, but it infinitesimally small translations of any type. So when we're, if we're going to shift something along by an infinitesimally small amount or that type of thing. So we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to notate this as, so let's say the change in some Q sub i. Now note when I use delta Q sub i, I mean the change in Q um, is equal to some function f sub i of Q times delta. Where this delta here at the end means uh, a, a very, very small real number. So that's the, the notational difference that we need to keep track of. Okay, so this means that the change in Q sub i dot will be f sub i dot of q times delta, because again, delta is just some real number. Okay, so we're going to use our um, new idea of a uh, general transformation like this, uh, and we're going to plug it into a Lagrangian, because in theory, if um, this infinitesimally small translation happens in Lagrangian, there should be no difference. So when I say this, I mean that, say the change in the Lagrangian should be equal to zero. All right, um, and so this is what we're going to prove, and we'll do this by using the chain rule again, the multivariable chain rule. So we'll say that the um, change in the Lagrangian L is the sum over i of the change dl dq, so uh, dl dq uh, sub i times delta q sub i plus dl dq sub i dot times delta q sub i dot. All right, so, and the idea of this all is that um, how much the gradient um, is dependent on qi times the change in qi plus how much the ground is dependent on qi dot times the change in qi dot. Okay, so now that we have our idea of um, how the ground will change, let's take some ideas from the other ground equations and apply them here. So we knew that um, dl dqi is going to be uh, p dot. So we, when we when we took this, so that means we're able to instead of using here this dl dqi, we can take this as p dot sub i times dq, uh, delta q sub i, and then this here um, plus dl dq sub i dq sub i dot was our momentum conjugate, and uh, so now we have p sub i times delta q sub i dot. All right, we're summing over all of these. Okay, so now you might be, you might recognize this as say some function, the derivative of some function times another function, plus the original function times the derivative of the second function, as the product rule. So we are able to now say that this would be sum over i of d, dt of p sub i delta q sub i. And because, again, we're assuming everything is well-defined and nice, we can swap the sums around, sum a derivative around, and so we'll find that the derivative of the sum of pi delta q sub i is our change in the Lagrangian. Okay, so this means that then we can sub in our original function up here. Right, so we have here that delta q is nothing more than uh, uh, some function times delta. So we'll have that this is then delta, or delta l is time derivative of the sum over i of pi times some function f of i, f of i, q times delta, and using this idea up here, that for um, a continuous transformation to make, um, for the Lagrangian to be symmetric under a continuous transformation, 
the change in Lagrangian should be zero. We can set this therefore equal to zero. Now, because delta is just some um, constant real number, we assume that it's not zero uh, because that would, yeah, that's not zero because it has to have been um, actually a transforming, it must have transformed uh, Q, and zero wouldn't actually transform it, it would just send it all to zero. So we can get, we can divide by delta, and so we'll have that. Um, 0 is equal to time derivative of the sum or i of p sub i times this function f sub i of q. Right, okay, so what this is telling us is that if we have some quantity q, which is the sum or i of the momentum of uh, p sub i times this function f sub i of q, um, under a transformation that uses f sub i, this quantity here will be conserved. Which is a very powerful idea, we'll come back to a little bit later. But even the idea um, of a intuitively sounds like it could be quite useful. Okay, so now to move on to a couple other examples. We know now that we have our uh, d, d, d q dt is equal to zero for q equal to uh, the sum of pi times f sub i. So when we were thinking back to a few of the other examples we've been on, uh, the first one, we, do, we would just have f i equal to one for all i, because that was the time derivative of the uh, p sub one plus p sub two is equal to zero. But now that we know uh, that if, now we know that a general case, so if we were to sum all uh, the momentums of uh, any number of particles, as long as they are all moved uh, uniformly, we would get that the momentum of the system is conserved. Right, so another uh, example that we did was that we had um, V of AQ1 minus BQ2. And in a similar way, we have now that the momentum, so let's say P, uh, we found that p1 dot times b minus uh, p, oh sorry, yeah, plus a times p2 dot is equal to zero. Right, and if we have over here, or we have our quantity in this case, will be p1 times b plus p2 times a. So that means that f1 would be equal to b, and f2 would be equal to a. And this is how it works out in that case. And so we can see here how these can be kind of generalized. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at another example, which is one that we haven't covered before. Uh, we're going to have a look at the double pendulum, or a, a, a relatively simplistic version of it. So we said that uh, the double pendulum is doable using Newtonian mechanics, and it really is, but it's just very complicated. Using the Grangian formulation, though, it would make life a lot easier. So for instance, we have, say, a massless uh, bar here, with a mass on the end, and then another massless bar, say, here, with another mass on the end. We want to model how these two um, masses move. Right, so first of all, we're going to need to have an idea of what angles are which, right? So we're going to define an angle theta here to be the angle between the first pendulum and the second, uh, or and the vertical rather. And then we're also going to add in or find another angle here. We'll call this phi, which will be the angle between the second pendulum and the first. Okay, so now we're going to start having a look at our um, coordinates. So we're going to have, say, the x1, which is the x component of the position of the first mass here, will be L times sine of theta. And y1 here is going to be L times cosine of theta. And now for the second, uh, the x component of the second for, uh, mass here, we're going to have L 
time sine theta, which you guys to here, and then another, or L1 rather, we'll call this just to keep things general, L1, and then, so for L1 here, and then we'll have this L1 sine theta, which you guys to here, plus L2 times um, sine of phi plus, cos, uh, phi plus theta. So we'll have this as L1 sine theta plus L2 sine of phi or theta plus phi. And likewise, we'll have y2 is equal to L1 cos theta plus L2 cos of theta plus phi. Okay. Right, so now um, we're going to have a look at differentiating things. So we'll have that x dot 1 will be L times theta dot times uh, cos theta and y1 dot will be minus L, um, L1 um, theta dot sine theta and that x2 dot will be theta dot L cos theta, or L1 cos theta, plus L2 times theta dot plus phi dot times cos of theta plus phi. And we'll have y2 dot is equal to minus theta dot L1 sine theta minus L2 theta dot plus phi dot times the sine of theta plus phi. Right, and in this case, uh, although we can keep it general, but for the sake of time, uh, we're going to set, uh, say that we have a special case of L1 equal to L2. Just the same time that this method will then work for um, L1 and L2 being different. Alright, so then we have, say, T1, which is the kinetic energy of the first one here, of the first mass. We're going to have some M over 2, where, again, we're going to assume the mass are the same as well. Again, it works out if you keep the mass different, but for the sake of time, we're going to keep them the same. Okay, so we have M over 2 times x dot, okay, so x dot squared, which would be L times theta dot cos theta, all be squared, plus minus L theta dot sine theta to be squared. Uh, we can take the L and theta dot outside of the squared, so we'll have L squared uh, times theta dot squared plus cos squared plus sine or times cos squared plus sine squared, cos squared plus sine squared is just 1 and so we get that T1 is therefore equal to m over 2 times L squared theta dot squared. Okay, so let's just keep this for later. Okay, now let's have a look at T2. So this is the kinetic energy of the second particle this second mass here, and um, we'll have m over 2 times uh, x, dot, mm, uh, x2 dot squared plus y2 dot squared, this y dot should be more apparent. Right, so we'll have uh, m over 2 times theta dot l cos theta plus l theta dot plus phi dot times cos of theta plus phi squared plus negative theta dot L sine theta minus L times theta dot plus phi dot sine of theta plus phi all to be squared. Right. And so when you square this out, when you square this out and simplify, you'll get ML squared over 2 times 
theta dot squared plus theta dot plus phi dot c squared plus two theta times, or sorry, two theta dot plus theta dot plus phi dot squared cosine phi. Back it. Okay, so now if there's no gravity, we can simply sum these two and we will have our Lagrangian. But in the case that there is gravity, we'll have to uh, pull out that we'll have, we have to account for the particle's altitude as well. So we'll therefore have L is equal to, we'll say ML squared over two, because we can bring the L squared out here, and times two theta dot squared plus theta dot plus phi dot to be squared plus two theta dot uh, times theta dot plus phi dot to be squared times cosine phi plus mg times two cos theta plus cos theta or, or cos of theta plus phi. Okay, now this is kind of, it's a big expression. So we can then sub that back into our ordinary branch equations and get our equation of motion. But as you can see, this is a lot of terms to be dealing with and we won't really go into it because it's not important to know, um, or it's not important to go through it. But now that we've shown that it can be done, it's simply just putting it in, doing some differentiation and uh, reordering things.